these acts of framing and reframing attract our attention to an intentional choice of perspective and to the problematics of selecting a point of view from which to look at reality, all the more so when this is past, lacunary and beyond our experiential reach. I want to start by showing you uh, the opening sequence of a film. Uh, the film is um, called Picturesque from 2012. Um, it's a short um, film uh, by Irina Botea, uh, which was filmed in Transylvania. Uh, and it consists in an exploration of the region uh, of the Apuseni Mountains, once part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, an area with a complicated history, not least because it had one of the most important and coveted gold reserves in Europe. Uh, in the film, the filmmaker and her small crew uh, search for beautiful shots uh, and are accompanied in their explorations by a Mr. Nelu, a native and a tourist writer for uh, the magazine, the picturesque Romania, uh, who shows them the area. What interests me in uh, this opening sequence is the various ways in which the act of looking and that of framing are made visible. So firstly, uh, Brecht's verses frame the opening shot in the entire film from a political angle and call into question the purpose apparently governing Botea's film of find finding a picturesque image. Secondly, the male voice um, comment of screen comment uh, problematizes the transparency of a camera framing a portion of the world and emphasizes the ambiguity of the concept of the picturesque while also attracting attention to the shot as shot, uh, as also reconfirmed by uh, the off-screen female voice, which is the director's voice. And thirdly, before Mr. Nelu is invited to talk about Avram Yanku, we hear in the off-screen the director asks the cameraman for a close-up. Uh, the camera then visibly searches for the right angle, zooming closer, closer to Mr. Nelu, as you have seen, moving sideways, better to frame him against the landscape. Um, other comparable moments in the film include a tentative close-up of Mr. Nelu taking a picture with his photo camera, in which again the adjustments become visible, 
and are mirrored by his own act of framing through the camera lens. Uh, visible framing also occurs internally to shots, as in this fixed long shot of the open door of the building where two kids and a half-eaten adult stand speaking to the camera for a long time. Uh, the interior's darkness, as you can see, augmented by the brightness uh, of the summer day, emphasizes the mise en abeam uh, framing. This vis visibility of framing is reinforced throughout the film by off-screen exchanging among crew members on the rightness of the image, uh, by Botea's discussions with Mr. Nelu about what he regards as picturesque, and by the directions explicitly given to the film subjects about how to position themselves and when to start moving or talking. The meaning of picturesque then is investigated through verbal and visual scrutiny of a collection of potentially sublime romantic topoi, including cloudy skies, dilapidated dwellings, abandoned interiors, hilltop cemeteries. Crucially, it is through framing that picturesque conveys its essayistic argument through a strategy that uh, raises questions regarding the tourist image and that is critically predicated on a dual recourse to the frame intended both as uh, the literal operation of mise en cadre and as narrative, ideological and cultural framing. The film reflects in Botea's own words on how tourism contributes to and perpetuates the perception of the world as an idyllic, extraordinary, safe, clean and uniform place and as a depoliticized zone experienced as a safe distance and easily consumable, consequently removing uncertainty, chaos and conflict. Simultaneously, it reflects on how the sublime is a matter of framing. Uh, the sublime is the majesty of nature seen from the inside through a real or imagined window frame. It is the distance provided by the frame which makes the scene sublime. Behind the image of rural charm confected by the camera angle, however, lurks a sense of depopulation, obsolescence and void, which is the direct result of the film's search for an object to shoot uh, and for an angle from which to shoot. This, visi uh, this visible search ultimately emphasizes a gap and a missing object. Picturesque has two endings, uh, both contributing in decisive ways to the film's argument. Uh, the film is in an interior, uh, sorry, the first is in an interior with large windows overlooking the mountains topped by a sublime sky. The vista is framed, as you can see several times, by the window and by the roof uh, top as well, the straw roof, uh, which edges the top of the screen. And uh, Mr. Nelu is, prof is uh, silhouetted, as you can see, against the window. The cameraman from the off-screen reads from a compilation of poems by Mr. Nelo himself. Uh, and at the uh, end of the film, Mr. Nelo reacts to his own verses with that sentence, yes, a picturesque image, uh, which is at once an unknowing comment, of course, on the last shot of the film, which frames him against the dramatic sky and mountains. After the end titles, uh, Mr. Nelu, now sitting in the middle of a meadow, reads a text uh, on his own experience on the shoot. So this coda retrospectively reframes the whole film, for Mr. Nelu's commentary reverses the point of view, which had firmly been placed on him for the duration of the film, and offers his perspective on the crew members and their motivations. If Brecht's opening quote framed the film by raising political and ideological questions, the coda could be seen as a Brechtian device that further breaks the illusion and subverts the film's potential transparency, queering the partiality of the point of view and hinting at all that was left out of the frame. Less than a decade ago, the expression essay film was encountered only sporadically and the form was relatively under-theorized. Today, the term is widely integrated into film criticism and analysis and is increasingly adopted by filmmakers and artists worldwide to describe their work. Substantial scholarly literature on the essay film, which has uh, been steadily growing and is still growing, has thus far mainly focused on the definition of the term. 
Uh, this has been variously identified with features including the expression of a subjective viewpoint, the heterogeneity of materials uh, and languages, the mix of fact and fiction, the presence of a sustained critical engagement, uh, the dialogue with the spectator, the adoption of a reflexive voiceover. This debate, in my view, has now reached something of a standstill. Uh, critics agree on some characteristics and disagree on others, while the essay film, heretical, radical, innovative and elusive, always remains a one remove, resisting all attempts at defining it, so much so that each new encounter with a specific text prompts the question whether it belongs to the category or not, and why so. I believe it is now necessary to move beyond this debate and to start asking not what an essay film is, but what it does and where it does it. Uh, bringing issues of practice to the fore means responding to the contention that, like every modern work, the essay does not raise problems of meaning, but rather a problem of usage, or in other words, a problem of effect and of functioning. The core of my argument is that the essay film's work is disjunctive and that its most significant gesture is that of placing itself in in-between spaces in relation to genres, formats, conventions, materials, technologies and textual elements and of articulating its thinking in interstices. I characterize these interstices on the basis of philosophical, aesthetic, anthropological and cultural studies theories and seek to define them in relation uh, to issues of practice. Today I will focus on the practice of framing and on the idea of the object of the essay film. In writing some film, the frame is usually understood as an element at once of the image, of the apparatus of the cinema and of filmic language that participates in, supports and structures meaning making in multiple ways, which have to do with diverse spheres including technology, perception, psychology, aesthetics, narrative, ideology and culture. The word frame is rather, in itself, rather ambiguous. Uh, Edward Brannigan, for instance, has identified and investigated <laughs> no less than 15 different ways in which the term is used in discourses uh, about film. Here I am particularly interested in the physical act of framing, either through a lens or through post-production devices, and in, in its emblematic and critical dimensions, and more specifically in how the act of framing contributes to produce essayistic thinking in film. My interest in framing follows from the observation that to frame is ultimately to detach an object from its background and thus to create a gap between object and world. This process in film is at once literal and uh, metaphorical, practical and conceptual. The essay film seeks its object by dividing up and sharing out, to use an expression by Nancy, um, and these are operations that pertain at once the intellectual definition of the object and its visual production. It has often been remarked that the object of the essay is multiform and that anything can be its object. For Aldous Huxley, Huxley for instance, the essay uh, is a literary de device for saying almost everything about almost anything. Adorno similarly observed that the essay owes its freedom in its choice of objects, its sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis all priorities of factor theory to the circumstance that for it all objects are equally near the center. Uh, Reda Benzmaia has argued that the specificity of the essay must be sought not in its production of objects but in their arrangement, one uh, that is based on uh, uh, the marking of a gap. And he writes, the objects uh, used by the essayist are not drawn from a particular genre or domain. They can be taken from any semantic or cultural register, history, literature, painting, philosophy, sports, film, cooking, whatever you like. And consequently, they are distinguished only by the way they are inserted into the essay's discourse. But generally, they are constituted as specific objects by the gap they manifest in relation to a semantic or rhetorical norm. 
Such a gap is due to the heretical stance of the essay, which resists compositional unity and classical rhetoric. As Ben Smyer has suggested, uh, citing Michael Tort's reference to a fundamental structure of gap, what the essay challenges is the closure of the text as totality and the mastery of meaning as truth. In relation to the essay film, then I argue, the uh, act of framing often becomes the visible search for an object, either in the living image of the world or within film or photo archives. This practice is at once literal uh, and conceptual insofar as framing is a filmic operation used to clarify that the essayistic object is not natural and in evidence, but must be looked for, circumscribed and cut out from its background. It is a process of framing the world from a particular viewpoint, but also it is the coming into being of the object of the essay, which does not pre-exist the essay. As such, framing uh, in the essay film often becomes the visible evidence of a process of thinking. It becomes performative, for it performs the act of essayistic reflection, and in so doing, uh, it relativizes it as well. By isolating the object against its background and by wedging a gap between the two, framing contributes to undermining the totality of the text and its mastery of meaning as truth. The object of the essay then is elusive and the essay film often thematizes its elusiveness uh, by foregrounding a gap. This is particularly evident in archival films, which many essays are. The missing images, the voids in the archive, come to represent the unavoidab unavoidable incompleteness of knowledge, the holes in uh, historical memory, the intangibility of truth, the limitations of thought itself. In this, the essay film is a meta-historical form which reflects on a historical object and at the same time on the constructiveness of the processes that constitute it as such. The following case studies, uh, through a discussion of which I will further conceptualize the, fu the function of framing as the coming into being of the essay and of its object, uh, are indeed archival films, which draw from either still or moving images at the dual purpose of constructing a historical object and of deconstructing historical discourse. As Michael Zreed uh, uh, has claimed um, in an article on archival practices, found footage filmmaking is a meta-historical form commenting on the cultural discourses and narrative patterns behind history. Whether picking through the detritus of the mass mediascape or refinding through image processing and optical printing the new and the familiar, the found footage artist critically investigates the history behind the image, discursively embedded within its history history of production, circulation and consumption. This passage is a good description of what uh, Muhammad Reza Farzad uh, Gomogur, uh, or Into Thin Air, aims to do. The film is an investigation of archival footage and photographs of the Iranian Revolution and in particular of the massacre of Tehran Jale Square that took place on Black Friday, the 8th of September 1978. It focuses on less than a minute of footage of the killing and wounding by the military of a never clarified number of citizens who seemingly unaware of the martial law and official curfew that had been declared the day before but only announced that morning had gathered to protest against the Shah's rule. While official sources acknowledged the death of 200 people, thousands of bodies were brought to Behazar Cemetery the day after and many others were never found by their relatives. The silent footage produced by an anonymous source became public only after the fall of the regime in 1979. Farzad, as the first person voiceover remarks at the start of the film, was born in the same month of 1978. This suggests an effective involvement in the historical events, which colors the investigation and frames it instantly from within a first person perspective, further conveyed by a sequence in which archival footage is directly projected over the bodies of the filmmaker and his family. The narrator's sentiments find expression not only in, this, uh, in the sense of mourning that infuses the entire piece, but also in the act of rewinding, slowing down, freezing and replaying the sur uh, surviving footage over and over again. 
The repetition seems at once the manifestation of a profound disbelief induced by the horrific nature of the event and of an urge to behold and ponder it. While repeated viewings cannot explain what remains incomprehensible in its obtuse and shocking violence, the scrutiny of the images is a form of homage to the victims, of course, many of whom have remained unnamed, and a way to grant them visibility and remembrance. But Into Thin Air works at various levels simultaneously, including those of the historical account and of meta-historical discourse. Its historical approach is, however, unorthodox, Based, uh, based as it is on micro-historical narratives that are mostly imaginary, uh, though also entirely plausible and thus emblematic. Through a reframing activity, the essays term mon montagist uh, uh, isolates in the archival footage the shapes of some of the people desperately running away from the bullets, then engages in a process of identification of the anonymous victims, searching for them in further documentary photographs and footage of the Iranian Revolution. This search is, of course, at once fictional and impractical. It is impossible to clearly see any of the faces uh, and thus also to recognize them in other documents. Nevertheless, by carefully analyzing the silhouettes and by linking them to images of men and women in other photographs and footage, the film fulfills at least two purposes. It individualizes and humanizes the victims and it finds a way of constructing, starting from a radically fragmentary and incomplete document an iconographic narrative and representation of this emblematic event. Tasvir ro bar migardan amma dobare neba mikonam. Amma chehre hech ki mahdum nist. Man tu in tasvir donbale chi migashtam? Beizam neba mikonam. یه دستشو میذاره رو زمین و میشه از گوشه قاب خارج میشه کیه؟ شاید این زنی چادر سفید یا این زن دست راستی یا این زن که کنار دختر بچهش بایستده یا این خانومه که لبخم میزنه یا شاید هم میزنه فیلم بردار این زن این یکی یا این یا این زن که چند روز قبل از پشت بوم خونشون تظاهرات نگاه می کرده مرد با یه دست بازوی دست مخالفشون می گیره و می بوه. سکندری میخوره و میفته میفته و لای جمعیت گم میشه این کیه؟ این پیر مرده که نمیتونه باشه شاید صاحب این موتوره شاید این جوون که رو تیشرت شماره پنج و دو هرد شده یا این مرد پیرن سفید که گل دستشه یا یکی از این مردارا Precisely because it is fundamentally imaginary, unsystematic and profoundly lacunary, Into Thin Air's collage construction is essayistic. It is a construction that rests on framing, here intended as a post-production practice, 
The film engages with two forms of optical reframing. The first is based on graphics. You have just, we are, have just emphasized that. Each time the footage is rewound and scrutinized, the human shape, as we have seen, is outlined by a circle traced around it, which detaches it from the crowd and from the background. This practice brings the reframed figure into existence at once as a historicized subject by rescuing it from its position as anonymous, invisible member of a crowd and as historical object, not a generic victim, but an object demanding historical inquiry. The second approach consists in reframing portions of the original image by moving closer to a part of it and thus changing its focus, as in the case of a photograph of the massacre taken from the perspective of the military, a pyramid of bodies pathetically and futilely scrambling to seek escape from the line of fire. <laughs> شاید نبش خورشیده که تیر میخوره تو کتفش رو میفته تو جو سرشو که از لب جدول پیاده رو بالا میاره فقط یه مشکفش خونی و پلاکارد داغون و چادر پار پوره میبینه لابد اوق میزنه و سینه خیز خودش رو میکشه تو اولین کوچه Reframing sections of the crowd here mobilizes the image, further increasing its pathos, uh, while also emphasizing emblematic details that could otherwise go unnoticed, such as the buttocks of a man bending in the hope to find shelter among the people surrounding him, as if he were digging in the pile of bodies. This reframed image stands out as an indictment of the barbaric assault on the disarmed civilians and of their dehumanization. In an article on filmic reframings of archival photographs of the North American Civil War, Judith Lancioni has remarked that reframing visually advances the argument that history is not a product, an absolute truth enshrined in libraries and archives, but rather an ongoing critical encounter between past and present. That encounter, moreover, is not passive or accidental, it is rhetorical, that's something that interests me. Reframing is a rhetorical strategy that attracts attention to the epistemology of seeing and thus also to the historicity of the image. And to quote again from the same article, the effect of reframing is analogous to the operation of a very elemental perceptual gestalt, namely, namely the figure ground relationship. Figure and ground are relative but exclusive terms. In other words, what is conceived as background cannot be reconstituted as figure without a certain amount of conscious adjustment. When viewers see close up uh, an individual whom they have just seen as part of a group shot, they must make perceptual readjustments that may make them more conscious of the epistemology of seeing. By cutting figures out of their background and by reframing images into thin air, meta-historically invites us to reflect upon practices of reading visual evidence. Peter Thompson's universal diptych adopts a comparable strategy. The work is composed of two films, Universal Hotel and Universal Citizen, both from the same year and lasting both 28 minutes each. The two films are, at first sight, quite distinct, almost unrelated. In truth, they are intimately, if unfathomably connected, as all diptychs, they develop a subtle intertextual dialogue. The first is an investigation into a series of horrifying hypothermia Nazi experiments carried out by Dr. Sigmund Rasker at Dachau concentration camp in 1942. The purpose of the statistic experiments was ostensibly to identify the best method to rewarm German pilots who fell into the Arctic Sea. In particular, the film focuses on one inmate, a Polish prisoner of war, who was immersed a number of times in a pool of icy water and then revived in various ways, including by physical contact with another inmate, a German ex-prostitute. 
in the absence of detailed information and starting from 11 photographs and two drawings found in archives in six different countries, Peter Thompson reconstructs the mechanics of the experiment. The film ends with a dream of the Polish prisoner setting a universal hotel. Note that the film also has started with the filmmaker shooting images from his window in a hotel of the same name in Siena, Italy. Universal Citizen, on the other hand, is the highly subjective account of a trip of the filmmaker to Guatemala, where he also stays at a Universal Hotel. His activities and encounters mostly take place off screen, including his dealings and conversations with a Libyan Jew, a former Dachau inmate who refuses to be photographed, but eventually agrees to be filmed from a distance while swimming. De declaredly prompted by the filmmaker's encounter with an image as for Into Thin Air and the Black Friday footage, Universal Hotel shares more than one feature with Farsad's film. Both start from radically incomplete visual evidence of historical events and ask similar questions uh, about the ethics, motivations and results of archival practices. Both construct their objects starting from a handful of images and create an essayistic historiophoty, to use uh, Hayden White's uh, term for the representation of history and our thoughts about it in visual images and filmic discourse. Historiopathy uh, in these films is declaredly partial, evidently labored and overtly fictional, but not false or void uh, of historiographical value. Indeed, uh, all these films create narratives that are possible and thus deeply emblematic, and both use reframing techniques as a theoretical and critical practice. Universal Hotel starts with a black screen. The filmmaker's voice states, um, I see everything from a distance, from the, my window in the Universal Hotel. This immediately establishes a mise en cadre, uh, which is at once perceptual, uh, a perspective framed by a window, and cognitive, a temporal and experien experiential fairness. After the film's title is displayed, a woman traverses a square, seeing as Piazza del Campo, with uncertain gaze, moving away from the camera till she exits the frame. Simultaneously, we hear the director making phone calls in different languages about his search for documentary evidence for the Dachau experiments. The scene is twice repeated from the same angle. Uh, then it is reframed from higher up, as if from a hotel window. These acts of framing and reframing attract our attention to an intentional choice of perspective and to the problematics of selecting a point of view from which to look at reality, all the more so when this is past, lacunary and beyond our experiential reach. A little later, the narrator describes his first encounter with a photograph, the first part is interest, saying, 1980, I open a book and see this photograph. However, as you can see, the image is reframed, no longer inserted in its publication context. It is surrounded by a large black frame. The voiceover provides us with contextual information from the book, the names of the doctors carrying out the experiment, in which a man, simply called test person, floats in icy cold water. The fact that several rewarming methods had already been tested and that the scientists were now testing what they called animal rewarming by means of physical contact between test persons and former prostitutes. After another black screen, the narrator recounts a strange dream he uh, had the same year in which he saw a cathedral in fl flames from his window at the Universal Hotel and then spoke to Tess Parson from behind a closed door. This dream, which returns later in the film, has the function of a farther frame uh, after having been given the only factual elements of the story, grounded in archival research and in published sources, we are now warned through the dream that the reconstruction of the events which the narrator will attempt should be framed from a subjective, imagined and affective perspective. After the dream, three more images of hypothermia experiments at Dachau, with the filmmaker um, 
uh, which the filmmaker traced in other books from various archives are shown, again out of context and surrounded by black frames. They spark a series of hypothetical reconstructions of the events in which the images are organized and reorganized into meaningful sequences adapted to tell the story of Tess Parson and of the experiment. As Gary Weissman has shown through a detailed textual analysis and on the basis of contextual research on the test, on the Dachau tests, these narrative reconstructions are pure fabrication, as we have no means to know that all the photographs pertain the same experiment, what method of rewarming they are a record of, and even if the test person was the same in all pictures. Weissman also notes that because in each new narrative iteration, of which there are seven in total, the narrator notices new details and corrects previous misreadings, viewers, uh, Weissman writes, may not observe problematic aspects of his narrative that the filmmaker himself appears to overlook, sharing those presumptions that shape what is seen and not seen in the photographs. End of course. This results in an affective involvement of the spectator in the narrative, which is, however, offset by the detached tone of the narrating voice and tempered by the oniric framing of the film. I would argue that the complexity of the resulting spectatorial experience, at once emotional and detached, horrified and, uh, by the harrowing story and always aware of its uh, emblematic fictionality, is a powerful critical tool that inscribes a distinctive meta-historical discursiveness in the film. The narratives that Tess Person presents are based on a reframing and are in themselves reframings. Each new image he finds, each new detail he notices, each interpretative error he acknowledges, prompt a readjustment of perspective, a rearrangement of the sequence of photographs, and a rewriting of the story and of history. The reframing is at once literal and metaphorical, and is conveyed both by, uh, through the voiceover, which interprets and reinterprets the photographs, attracting our attention to all these new elements, and optically by moving closer to the images as uh, to blow up certain details. Like in Into Thin Air, refrain narratives are thus created which are overtly fabricated yet plausible, answering an urge to fill the gaps of the archive, to join the dots of the visible evidence, to give voice to the silent witnesses. The, this urge compels both Farzad uh, and Thompson to compulsively interrogate their archival images over and over again, entreating them to reveal their secret, to the point that narratives stem from them. Uh, in one case in each film, these narratives near a docudrama-like move towards cinematic reenactment, uh, though one tempered by self-reflexivity. Um, so uh, sequences of fixed images are mobilized through reframings uh, so as to be experienced by the spectators almost as a moving sequence. The one in Universal Hotel consists in an iteration of the story that deploys fabricated sound effects and voiceover narration, a strategy that ultimately emphasizes precisely all that the archive lacks. The test person is a prisoner chosen by chance. He has arrived at the test site. He removes his uniform and puts on what he is given. He faces the photographer. Now he is given a pilot shirt and pants. Now he is given a flight suit and a life preserver. Two wires are raised from the barracks floor. He is ordered to turn left. As Weisman has written, the addition of sound effects creates an illusion of immediacy and presence. In its very effort to transcend the fixity of the still image and recreate the photographed event, this iteration calls the viewer's attention to how mute and inanimate are the photographs themselves. Let me say also that, you know, when you watch this sequence after having seen many other, like the Effect, you know, the effective effect is much, is much uh, bigger than just seeing it out in, in isolation as we have done here. 
Thompson's attempts at revitalizing the archive are, however, defeated, for the voids are so radical that they can only be filled by a leap of imagination. There is no visual evidence of the animal rewarming test that is at the core of the story, and thus the narrator over dark images of black water says that he imagines what he imagines did happen. Images filmed in 1982 of the very site of the test then, um, um, uh, of which only a concrete floor remains, reconfirm the hard reality of the loss of evidence as well as of our experiential distance from the events. With a strong reframing effect comparable to the famous speech at the end of Orson Welles' F for Fake, where Welles revealed that for the past 17 minutes I've been lying my head off, the narrator now admits what I found in seven archives is one aim, two drawings and 11 photographs. The aim is the equivalent of an amber. The two drawings document the end of any test and the 11 photographs emphasize a uniform, how it fastens, how it sags when wet. The making of uniforms was the duty of the Ministry of Textiles. The photographer made the photographs for their designers. I make statements about the photographs that cannot be proven. I speak with uncertainty. It is at this point that the narrator returns to his dream and reports the dialogue he had with Tess Parson in it, which touches on the issue of the ethics of giving a voice to silent witnesses, on intentionality and on the elusiveness of history. The recourse to dream is customary in Peter Thompson's documentary work, as discussed in an interview with Jonathan Rosenbaum. In the same interview, Thompson compares his subjective non-fictional filmmaking practice to the construction of heterocosmos, different worlds in which to experiment, which he understands in light of framing. He says, Renaissance writers sometimes leave a given world and generate an alternative one in which the claims of the world left behind are acknowledged or settled. That alternative world is both disjunctive and make-believe. Its separateness and limits are signaled by some original framing device showing it to be contrary to established fact. After being securely framed in that way, it then admits within its imaginary, imaginary world factual elements in order for them to be amplified. The Dreaming Universal Hotel is a further framing device that allows the mixing of factual reality and an enhanced psychological truth. But the film is further reframed by a second film with which it forms a diptych. Universal Citizen, a travelogue of the filmmaker's trip to Guatemala with his wife Mary, is also accompanied by Thompson's detached voiceover. Again, the narrator stays at a Universal Hotel, this time in Taizal, when it's, what is more, we recognize that the cathedral on fire in the sequence of the dream in Universal Hotel is in fact a view of from the narrator's hotel window in Universal Citizen. Did the dream take place in Guatemala? Is, it eponymous, is the eponymous Universal Hotel in Siena, in Taizal or both? Uh, as the narrative unfolds, we begin to question all spatial and temporal coordinates and the relationship between the two parts of the diptych becomes increasingly unfathomable and tantalizing. And so the second film generates a constant mental reframing of the first. If the reframing activity in Universal Hotel was optical as well as narrative, in Universal Citizen it is a matter of narration. At the start of the film, the narrator recounts a story about Cortez and the Mayan Indians, which was told to him, as he claims, uh, by a man swinging in a Cuban hammock, smoking a Turkish cigar and playing Arabian music on his Japanese tape recorder. He is a Jew born in Libya and schooled in six countries. That is to say, he is a cosmopolite, a universal citizen. The figure of the universal citizen, a Libyan Jew and a smuggler, is then further characterized by details that are reminiscent of Tess Perso. And I quote from the film, he was an inmate, inmate at Dachau. He was freezing there. Uh, there he dreamed of uh, hot baths and swore he would live in the tropics if he, sur if he survived. However, the mythical Cortez framework within which uh, he is first introduced places a question mark on the identification. The universal citizen then is elusive. As already mentioned, he refuses to be filmed except once, from a distance, and while he swims. Later, the narrator expresses doubts on his Dachau stories, which he says don't ring true. 
these readjustments are similar to the process of reframing that was at the core of the series of narratives of Universal Hotel. The film's ending provides the final reframing, showing the same sequence set in the Siena Square that mysteriously opened Universal Hotel. In this sec second version of the sequence, the voiceover explains that the woman we saw was his, the filmmaker's wife, Mary, whom Thompson had challenged to reach the fountain in the middle of the square with her eyes closed. The second sequence is thus a radical reframing of the first, which profoundly changes the meaning of what we have seen the first time. This Chinese box structure of universal diptych is somewhat reminiscent of that of D. Uh, uh, M. Thomas's 1981 novel, The White Hotel which also was concerned with the Holocaust, with the hotel that burns down, as happens to the Taizal Hotel after the filmmakers stay in the film, and with a cosmopolitan character, a Jewish woman whose complex life story coincides, as Leslie Epstein wrote with, and I quote, the diagnosis of our epoch through the experience of an individual, end of quote. The same can be said of Thompson's film. While universal diptychs claim, uh, claims to historical truth are admittedly limited and frail, its symptomatic efficacy is extraordinary. As Steve Harp uh, has written, for Thompson, the tendency to render the individual anonymous, the inevitability of personal loss and the delicate transitoriness of human relationships <coughs> are the benchmarks of universal citizenship. Conve conveyed through an anonymous individual who is impossible to identify, Thompson's universal citizenship is, however, also carefully situated and historically defined. As such, Tess Parsons slash universal citizen is an utterly emblematic figure through whom the diagnosis of an epoch is performed. To conclude, the work of progressive readjustments I have described today is a reframing labor, a process of gradual rethinking of the world and at the same time the coming into being of an essayistic object. Through their acts of visible looking and insistent reframing, Botea's picturesque Farzad's Into Thin Air and Thompson's Universal Diptych give body to the laboring of the essay film as search for an object and thus for itself as an open, performative, unfolding text, wholly dependent on and even equivalent with this search. Their labor of reframing indeed subtends the theoretical practice that qualifies what an essay film is and what it does. And to conclude with uh, words by Derrida, no theory, no practice, no theoretical practice can be effective if it does not rest on the frame, the invisible limit of between the interiority of meaning uh, protected by the entire hermeneutic, semiotic, phenomenological and formalist tradition and of all the intrinsic, extrinsic empiricals which blind and illiterate dodge the question. Thank you very much for listening. I can start just with a quick uh, just clarification, I guess, in terms of uh, the question of the frame. I mean, I initially you were, you were talking about um, the frame per se, but it, it seems to me that it, it's the reframing or the ref reflexive framing or even the recursive framing, the frame within a frame that is necessary here. So what happens to the outer frame? I mean, Derrida is always concerned with that outer one, the one that... Yeah, I mean, I think... Um I am kind of, you know, trying to um, sort of work in, on, a, on a very, like, walking on a very thin line in between, you know, those frames. Mm -hmm. um, and I admit myself that I keep, you know, sort of switching from one type of understanding of the frame to, it, to the other. Um, and I do so mostly like in you know in, the, in this kind of in this in this paper which is which is you know a, a slightly longer you know chapter of, of this book that I've been writing the attempt is to show uh, you know a, a kind of a, a series of cases you know a series of ways in which uh, the frame can be used to make things visible or you know like in, as particularly as in Botea's film but also in some optical reframings you know of the things that I have uh, shown in the other two films and then you know as you know instead you know this sort of insistent you know re framing, you know, of things that uh, you have just, uh, as you have just uh, kind of noted. Uh, so uh, my point ultimately is that um, 
you know, I, I don't think there are kind of rules uh, in essay filmmaking. Um, and each essay sort of you know, invents his own rules and finds new ways, you know, of sort of... Uh, so what I'm trying to do is to point at practices, you know, of, in this particular case, of, you know, uh, a coming into being on, of an object, of an essayistic object, you know. Uh, in all these films, in each of these films, um, there's no such thing as this object that they are, you know, looking at. There's no such thing as that object. The object is created. And what, uh, what this particular set of films kind of, you know, strikes me as, you know, there is a, a, a kind of a coherence. I know that two films are kind of closer together. The other one is slightly different. But they coherently sort of work on this visibility of the frame or of reframing uh, as a way of, you know, constructing this, um, this object. Um, so in a sense, it has to call attention to the frame. Yes. It can't, obviously, cinema frames endlessly all the time of, without necessarily. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and that is kind of you know, an interesting um, sort of you know, dialogue with, if you want, you know, more customary, let's say, fiction filmmaking or whatever, in which you know, most of the time framing becomes invisible. Um, you know, there is an invisibility of the frame, although, of course, you know, uh, also fiction film attracts attention to the frame in many different different ways, you know, um, and so none of these practices is exclusive uh, of the essay film, of course. So I'm not claiming that the essay film is different from, um, from other forms of filmmaking. Uh, it thinks in the ways in which film thinks, um, but it, you know, but it does it, I think, with a certain insistence. Um, Can I ask you also yeah. a question about your examples? I'm absolutely thrilled because you're introducing me to these films, and I don't know, but in your previous work, You've written on Nani Moretti, you've written on Antonioni, you've written on uh, Pasolini, you've written on filmmakers that are very well established, yeah. very well known. Yeah. Um, and here you seem to be like making a different kind of... When I, when I wrote, uh, the first uh, time that I, I tackled the essay film, uh, I, my book ended up being the, the first one in English that looked at the essay film um, as an object of study. And I felt that I was supposed to, that I had to uh, confront the big filmmakers. So uh, I looked at the essay film through um, uh, Harun Farocchi, Jean-Luc Godard, Chris Marker, uh, Pasolini, Antonioni. So I kind of uh, wanted to look, you know, because it was the first contribution, it was the first time you know, that, that sort of the object of the essay film was tackled, you know, in, a, in an organic way. I felt that it was important not to shy away from the, the big authors, you know, who kind of established the genre and who are recognized, so I want to ta tackle them straight on. But I've done that, you know, so I now have more freedom, you know, to look at uh, smaller films as well. Yeah, I'm so, so interesting. Thank you so much. It's really, um, yeah, giving me lots of ideas. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if you could talk a little more about the temporal aspect of framing. So you talked a lot about the visual yeah. type and whether sound and music play into that or whether they Absolutely. fall into more the invisibility yeah. side of framing. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think the fact that I come to this in this sort of very specific manner is um, due to the structure of this project from which this comes from because um, each chapter looks at a specific aspect of filmmaking. So I have a chapter on sound, I have a chapter on temporality. So what I've done is, you know, I try to kind of then focus my attention more so. Of course, you know, it's impossible to do so without touching on all the components. Uh, but I have done that, you know, so it does maybe come across as slightly artificial because, uh, because of, you know, this is just taken out of a broader project, you know, that looks uh, at those elements separately. But you're absolutely right and there would be so much you know that one could could do here with sound I mean even just the, the, for instance and temporality um, even just that uh, you know those few excerpts that I've been able to show you I think you know will have uh, sort of brought home you know that that you know issues of sound for instance and framing sound and framing sound is 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 a great um, you know way and contributes you know to these things I mean of course you know voiceover is the most immediate uh, element um, but it's not 
not just that, and, and you saw, for instance, in Farzad's film, you know, how he uses music, but then, you know, he uses uh, silence and noise, you know, and uh, so there's, there's absolutely, I mean, there's, there's, it's a stratification, and temporality is also a an extremely interesting um, aspect, uh, which again I haven't quite done here, you know, so I with that kind of, you know, in intentionality. But, um, you know, one of the, for instance, in particularly I think uh, in, um, in uh, the universal diptych, uh, temporality is extraordinarily uh, interesting, as in all diptychs, because of course, you know, the two texts kind of, you know, have their own temporalities, which um, are in dialogue with each other, but they also are in dialogue with history, as you saw. Um, and because of the continuous reframings, you know, you do lose this, the temporal, um, you know, those temporal coordinates, you know, which you slowly build up to, and then, you know, you realize uh, they, they, they are not, you know, such firm um, features and values, you know, as, as what you were led to believe, you know, so, uh, and one of the things that interests me about diptychs is indeed temporality and how, you know, that kind of gap, you know, that temporal gap, you know, between the two, uh, both in uh, the making of the film, but also in the spectatorship, um, you know, in viewing the film, so you know, which do you view first? And you know what happens you know, if you view one or the other, you know. And uh, so that's. Thank you very much for that question. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I thought it was a terrific paper, really yeah. uh, exciting and, and, and thought provoking. Uh, I'm particularly fascinated by that discussion of the archive around Interthinner and how it's it, it, it fails, but it's values productive for further inquiry. I wondered in the book, are you going to be looking at other material which is in which there is a gap, an interval, an elusive lost object where something is failing to capture what's in front of the camera, whether it's archive or live shooting. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about yeah. that coexistence of failure and the pr productivity of failure. Yes. Um, I look at other archival films, in particular um, I look at Respite by Harun Faroqi, uh, which again is a Holocaust film by the way, and again has an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily interesting relationship with sound because it, there's none, um, and it's an archival film. Uh, it's silent um, and it does kind of work on um, gaps again. Uh, and particularly on black screens, um, and uh, also very interestingly works on temporality uh, because um, it kind of, you know, allusively uh, sort of, you know, allows us to, uh, allows, allows certain levels of temporality to emerge in images, which we have seen over and over again. So very interestingly, it's a film that uses footage of the Holocaust, which is well known. Uh, and it's reframing, in a sense, it's reframing it as a fresh, you know, kind of uh, almost as uh, looking at it afresh and new. So I think there are other ways of, you know, of working, of reframing archival images. That is a particular example of it. You know, it's a, it's a film that succeeds in reframing uh, extremely s familiar um, footage as something that we haven't, almost like something we haven't seen before. Uh, quite a lot of, you know, essay films are archival films, not all of them are. Um, you know, like the, for instance, the Botea film that I showed at the very yeah. beginning is not. And what I like about it and what challenges me about these kind of films is that they are not obviously essay films, you know, that they are not possibly the most obvious, you know, that there is no voiceover kind of starting off and telling you this is what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, it still speaks to you um, as an essay and ultimately, you know, it's... Um, but so, yeah, I don't know whether I answer, but... Yeah. I'm not into this categorization and, and yeah. you know, border disputes, but I'm thinking of, say, a film like um, Dreams of a Life, where... Oh, sorry, Dreams, Dreams of a Life, where the interviews ultimately fail to capture the professed subject of that film. So I'm not sure I'd call that an essay film, but it's dealing with this idea about the productivity of, in that case, interview, not much sure kind of thing film, but also its failure to grasp this elusive object. Do you think there's a kind of overlap there with some of the films you're talking about? Uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, I have looked indeed at films that, uh, again, you know, sort of do something similar in terms of 
um, sort of, um, you know, slowly undermining indeed, as you say, the productivity of things. And in the, even in these films, ultimately, that's what they are doing, you know, ultimately, you know, like by, by constructing artists which then are, you know, sort of go, go back, you know, and say as well, you know, what is there, you know, so yeah. Hi, thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the very beginning you said you don't want to talk about what they is, what they are, what the essence of film is, but what they do and where. Yeah. And I don't want to belabor framing because, as you say, it's only one of your one of the strands of the book length study. But thinking about where these films are, not where they're made or where they're set, but yeah. where they end up, what their destiny is, as presumably not theatrically releasable in a way that art cinema could be, because they either through length or through their kind of perceived niche interest. So I mean, compared to the, the great names you mentioned and you discussed yeah. in your first book, where are these shorter films by less well-known artists who may work only in this form, as yeah. opposed to move from more recognized Absolutely. forms into essay forms? And is it a healthy place due to the proliferation of new platforms? And is it is, are they where they are? Are they thriving where they are? Are they? Mm, um, obviously, there is uh, there are differences, you know. And as you say, like you have kind of, in a sense, touched the two extremes. You know, on the one hand, you know, somebody like Godard, you know, who uh, obviously is very visible, and uh, uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, somebody who just makes small films, and that's what. Um, and there's a whole series of you know experiences in between. Um, I think uh, there is more scope today both to make essay films and to view them and to, for them to exist really, a, a new where, which is you know, obviously digital technology, which has made it possible to make them, to make them more cheaply. Not all of them, as you have seen, you know, are, you know, but it's, it's easier to make them and it's also easier to sort of have them out there in some form. Uh, but still, I think, you know, many of these films still go through the usual channels of a certain type of art film. You know, they go through festivals. Um, you know, some manage to be on DVDs, but often self-produced. Um, so they're not, you know, necessarily very, very widely available. Uh, I think it is a good moment for the SF film precisely because of the new digital technologies. Um, but it's still obviously very niche, you know, type of uh, type of filmmaking, um, and that is another way in which it is in a gap, in a sense, you know. So, mm. and is, there, is that institutional? So I realise I didn't actually say the part of the question I meant to say that that being framed in a fairly typical way as kind of art house uh, audience is that. Is there a danger that they could be doing more work on television, but has television simply just become uh, a hostile territory for this kind of work? And are they really just kind of contained within film festivals and other digital platforms? Would that be framed in a, in a particular way for specialist yeah. audiences? Whereas the essay film, if you think about TV documentary, yeah. I mean, that's a porous border zone as well. And obviously yeah. these would be at the more experimental end of first-person television or Absolutely. something, but is that uh, a shame? I haven't encountered too many of these films which were made for television or, or screened on TV in a kind of a normal way rather than exceptional way. There are some exceptions. I mean, I can think, for instance, of Alexander Sukhorov, uh, but then, you know, like, it's a, I think it's an extraordinary exception. And of course, you know, he also has an aim uh, beyond, you know, that. So he has made some extraordinary films which are in episodes and what television would allow you to make uh, a series in episodes and each episode is a different uh, s um, duration. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but there are exceptions, I think. Um, the vast majority are made, you know, uh, either, or they're, they're showing galleries in museums, so again, you know, the kind of art film kind of thing. Um, a few make theatrical distribution, but they would be the big ones, you know, the big names. Um, people who are documentaries or are, you know, fiction filmmakers. So I don't know whether TV is, is the best breeding ground. I would say certain televisions, perhaps. Arte, for <laughs> instance, would be one. But again, we are in that kind of, you know, sort of category still. Mm. On the other hand, I mean, as I said, the digital world is providing more platforms. Uh, 
uh, and you do encounter more films now on the internet, so you know, more of these things, uh, it's easier to get to them, it's easier to see them, and it's easier even just to find out that they exist, and then, you know, you can trace them. So it does make a change, it did make a change, and obviously it also made a change in terms of technologies, so the possibility, for instance, of doing editing work you know, in, in a kind of, you know, on a computer. Um, so, and of course, you know, it's a genre also that it's now certain, you know, there is the, uh, the video essay as well, which is, I think, is there are two distinct things, you know, but there is a kind of, you know, maybe one, at, uh, one border, you know, of, of uh, where they overlap. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank the you. <laughs>